On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? Doing so well. How are you today? I am doing excellent, Lance. And this, this episode, Lance, is part two of our conversation with the Wylands, the private investigating duo who are working for private investigations for the missing on the disappearance of Phoenix Colden. That's correct. They're doing this work pro bono through their organization, Lakefront Investigations, and they are two really professional, really wonderful people, just genuine human beings. And what we're doing with this conversation is introducing our listeners to the investigators behind the missing person stories that we present as well. So it's very important for us to let people know that if they're contributing, whether it's through their own investigating work or financially contributing to PIs for the Missing, we want to let you know that We have individuals like Ness and Andy and Lou and Greg. We want you to meet them and get to know them and get to know their personalities and get to know how dedicated they are and how much they care about these families. That is exactly right, Lance. And I do want to remind people that they can donate uh, on the site, investigationsforthemissing.org. And this nonprofit is really chugging along now, Lance. And very soon, we're going to bring you an interview on a new case that is being covered uh, by Private Investigations for the Missing. And if you haven't done it already, be sure to follow Private Investigations for the Missing on Twitter at PI for the Missing. Also, check out their website and the blog at investigationsforthemissing.org. Okay, everyone, thanks a lot for listening. We will be back with more on the disappearance of Phoenix Colden. Our coverage on her case is not done by a long shot. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Just the peace of mind, that's another uh, element that I know Bruce is very uh, heavily focused on, is providing peace of mind to families and providing a relationship to families. And that that is really goes much further than I think people think, uh, that someone knows, hey, someone's looking into this. You might not have all of, you might not solve it, you know, a particular one. You, you might not. You, you may, but just having that that person to go to, those people to go to and, and check in and vice versa. I think that's a, a often underrated or underscored element to the whole thing. And Vanessa, I think that that's a lot of the what you did, what the service that you provided back in uh, sunny San Angelo, San Angelo, Texas with the Sheriff's Department. And uh, that uh, what was that not the Sheriff's Department where you, you were the uh, you were working with uh, victims of of uh, kind of violent situations. 
Um, so yes, we I, I worked with both um, the sheriff's department and a volunteer organization, and um, the organizations themselves did a lot of the heavy lifting um, to to kind of bridge those gaps. Um, I shouldn't say it that way, but a lot of what the um, leadership of those organizations did was talk to various members of the law enforcement community to kind of get their names out there, you know, show their creds, you know, um, and, and that's really, honestly, I feel that that is um, my job and Andy's job when we're dealing with anyone, to, you know, Maryland or Missouri or Arizona, we have have to really present ourselves as you know, we're not part of this particular community, we're part of this other community, but this is what we're doing. Um, this is how we're doing it. And is there anything that you can do to help us? Or is there anything we can do to help you? And, and I think as long as we're approaching it as relationship building, and we're, we show that we have skin in the game, um, I, I think that that's really what will, what will help you know, those situations. And I, I, I don't see any, um, I, I haven't had any issues uh, with law enforcement, even though um, that first case that we had, uh, there was a general, it felt like lack of, of engagement um, in, in some ways. But when I look at the fact that there are people calling in all the time, you know, with this kind of these tips and yeah, I, I can understand. And so it really just takes us going a little bit face to face sometimes and, and you know, uh, showing rather than just, uh, man, I don't know how to how to phrase it, but that it is uh, another plug. It is shows and uh, opportunities like Crawl Space, what you guys are doing with your with, with your resources, with your network, with your talent. What you guys are doing is a, absolutely a part of building, and it is bridge building, Vanessa, because a lot of bridges have been broken by by crappy private investigators. Um, the Phoenix, uh, the uh, Phoenix's parents, Goldia and Lawrence, are are experienced in that area. Crappy investigators. Um, I also wanted to say real quickly before I I will turn it back to you guys, but I want to say real quickly in line of, uh, you know, the, the, the skills, the experience, the knowledge that we are bringing, the subject matter expertise that Vanessa and I are bringing to these investigations. Um, there's not a lot of use for me outside of the military. It really isn't for people like me. I mean, I can outside of the Department of Defense, right? So if I can bring all of what I understand and, and maybe even some of my friends with me on this journey with Vanessa um, on this journey that we are going on, that we can leverage some of the tools and, and different perspectives that um, maybe traditional law enforcement, they because of different tactics, techniques and procedures, they look a different direction. They do things a little bit differently. That's OK. They they've proven that they can do their jobs. I, I, nobody's saying that a cop can't do his or her job uh, if they if they want to, if they want to do their job. They can absolutely do it and they can do it well. So uh, no discredit to them, but just a different perspective. Um, and, and that's what I feel most strongly about here. And I think I've talked maybe to Lou about this, that I when when you guys had asked me earlier, asked us earlier how we got into this, and Vanessa, you you did share exactly, you detailed exactly how we got involved, how I got, how you pulled me in to uh, private investigations. But it was that moment where I realized, holy mackerel, I have got, um, I have I have an opportunity to the taxpayers paid a lot of money to get me where I am, you know, skill wise, knowledge wise. On the, all that stuff, not bragging, just saying that a lot of money has been put into this tool right here. And so why can't I, why shouldn't I then put this tool into use domestically to, to do something important, like maybe reuniting families with their loved ones. And so that's where my, I, I'm sorry, I know I'm going way back in time at the beginning of this conversation, but, but that's where, that's where my heart is on that. Yeah. It's really interesting and really cool that you say that because Honestly, I I get I we we hear so many uh, stories where people have those tools and they just don't use them for whatever reason or they use them for 
the wrong purposes. And uh, it's so it's so cool that you have recognized that. And um, very interesting that you said that a lot of money has been put into that because it's true. You know that, and that there's a whole uh, there's, a, there's there's a whole community of people like yourselves that have that 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 funding that has been put into them for this purpose for doing something like like this. I got a buddy down in in North Carolina who I connected with Lou. I, I put him and Lou in touch, and this buddy of mine, you know, he's retired uh, military, retired army, also uh, prior cop. And so the discussion between him and Lou, I'm sure, was, you know, really eye to eye, uh, really productive. And, and that's the feedback I got from my buddy when, when I talked to him afterwards. Well, Lou's son is, uh, is an attorney, and I'll brag on Lou's son for him. Lou's son is doing amazing work down in North Carolina doing uh, military law, primarily focusing on military law. Uh, so it seemed like a natural fit uh, to put my buddy and Lou's son together, uh, I think, that's a dream team. And if you can get Lou's son involved in private investigations for the missing uh, Mr. Maitland, I think you'd be well served. I think this organization would be well served by, by relationships like that. I guys, I think we need, we need lawyers in here because I would like to, I, I asked Lou at one point, can we, can we, can we subpoena somebody? Can we ask, can we demand information? Can we subpoena a police department? Can we subpoena an individual? And of course, you can't do that without court action. And I know that. My my, I know that. It's a really great point you make there. It'd be um, amazing to subpoena people. I actually want to see uh, Vanessa subpoena somebody because I feel like that'd be badass. I feel like she'd march up to the door. Probably probably would. Uh, you know, obviously with a face mask. And I feel like she would just rip their face mask off and say, "Get in the car." Absolutely not. First of all. <laughs> If there are steps involved, I have to take a couple seconds, <laughs> catch my breath after the stairs, and then maybe I'll knock on the door. <laughs> you mean kick the door down? <laughs> knock, knock with your foot. No. So a little while ago, uh, you mentioned that there was an unusual pattern of calls um, before Phoenix went missing. Can you get into that a little bit more and what you meant by that? I don't think I'd be speaking out of turn by saying this because it's been in several um, public forums, but um, one of the gentlemen that um, was romantically tied to Phoenix, uh, his calls ceased immediately after she disappeared. There shouldn't have been any reason, um, especially because they were talking multiple times a day um, throughout the entire day. Um, and then the night before they had a very long call. Um, now this person was cleared of, of any um, suspicion. So we can't, you, you know, we, we obviously can't say that he's involved um, for any malicious reasons. Um, but I would say that if, he, if there was some knowledge uh, that led him to stop calling that phone and maybe calling another or just stop calling altogether. Um, I, I'd, I'd want to know, I'd, I'd want to look, look um, people in the eye and, and know why um, that's oxygen network referred to him as Michael B. And that's as far as I think we'll go. Okay. And I was wondering do you think there is evidence or have you found evidence to suggest that Phoenix wasn't planning on coming back? I mean, other than the obvious that she didn't uh, come back or she is still missing? Uh, no, there were um, one of the things that Goldia brings up often are some glasses, some reading glasses that she had in her car um, that she really loved. Um, so she wouldn't, but she also left a laptop, a tablet. Um, she left several items of, of clothing. So, um, in a bag. And the way that I would look at that bag is, oh, that's an overnight bag. As soon as I, I they told us what was in it, um, I was like, oh, that's, you know, an overnight bag. So I don't understand why someone would pack that way. And then we also we, don't know that everything, Vanessa, I'm so sorry. I, we also don't know that everything that was in that's in that bag today as Goldia presents it when she pulls the bag out and she takes things out and she says this, this, this. Uh, I'll have to clarify with her. I, I, I feel like those I, those items were scattered in the car. That bag was there, but I don't believe that bag was filled with things that you might expect for an overnight type trip. But that's something that we'll have to explore a little bit more, Vanessa. Yeah. 
I, I was, I am under the impression that they were in the bag. Um, and there may have been other things like, I mean, I used to work in DC. So I had several pairs of shoes in my car because I had walk to the car shoes, you know, walk to the parking lot shoes. And then I had office shoes, you know, so a lot of those things can be explained away um, that way. Um, but many of the things that were found in the bag, um, I, I believe uh, those were, it, it just sounded like an overnight kit. And I want to go back real quick to the phone calls that you said happened. Were they all, you said that there was a, a number of phone calls that, that occurred leading up to the disappearance and then all of, and then that stopped. Were all of these calls from the same number or was it a flurry of phone calls from different numbers? Oh, no. Um, I was just talking about that one number, that one in particular. Now, there are um, other, there, there were other phone calls. M most of the calls were between Goldia and either Lawrence or, or excuse me, Phoenix and either Goldia or Lawrence. Um, and then we had a few kind of, um, you know, random fr family friends, many of them that we can um, explain away. Uh, but when you know, Andy and I, we call all the time. If I disappear over a weekend and he doesn't call my phone often, even if we're having an argument, um, that that doesn't look great. And it, it just opens up a line of questions, I believe. Right. That, is, that is interesting. And that, that one particular phone number has been traced to a particular person or not yet? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Okay. So when we say the call with Michael B., the calls of Michael B stopped abruptly that day. Well, I think we don't see anything after that day. Is that correct, Vanessa? I think that day is the last on the record that we've seen. Um, yes, that is the the last day. So mm -hmm. it, absolutely, it, if we are able to get um, uh, the nineteenth through you know the beginning of the year or something like that, the rest of the nineteenth through the beginning of the year, we may be able to see um, different patterns. Absolutely. Um, but we, we are also going off of, um, again, a little bit of memory from various people that were involved. But it is um, one of the things that I, I feel is always a good line of, um, you know, investigation is just kind of looking at communication patterns, because that'll tell you more about a person, just who they talk to regularly, when they talk to them, you know, um, it, I think that shows more about a person than um, anything. And even at that time, a lot of people weren't talking on the phone. It, it was transitioning to, you know, texting mostly and, and things like that. So um, those long conversations that those are important to us to, to see and to know. Have you uh, had an opportunity to look at Goldia or Lawrence's phone records as well? And were they all in the same plan? They are all on the same plan, um, but I believe that the view, for lack of a better word, uh, we only had um, Phoenix's calls. Those particular logs were just uh, Phoenix's calls. Um, and uh, I think I, I would hate to, that's one of those kind of um, shaky areas, you know, uh, we're so new in our relationship, I think it would, take a little bit for us to ask them um it would take a little bit more trust lawrence has successfully passed a what, what often people call lie detect lie detector test you know uh, a polygraph examination with law enforcement with a with a with, with a contracted law enforcement professional uh, goldia has not yet uh for for reasons that uh, she's you know explained to them and and uh, not that she's been avoiding it uh, uh, but she's got They've got reasons why she's not a candidate for a successful polygraph. And, and I will point out, too, that um, Vanessa and I have been through several polygraphs in our career, throughout our career. It's a, it's a strange in, um, experience the first time, and it's a strange experience the 12th time. So, um, and they're not entirely accurate. There, it's not proven science, it's it's theorized science, and it's to give indications for further questioning. It, you can't, nobody has ever been, uh, you, you cannot, I don't believe anyway, you cannot uh, um, find somebody guilty for a, um, for a failed uh, polygraph examination. 
And you meant you were uh, taking those tests? You were uh, on the receiving end or you were uh, giving them? Yeah, receiving. Yeah. And that's typical for uh, for your job after uh, things things happen, arrests are made or whatever? No, um, it's standard. Uh, standard to, to it's a uh, indicator of trust, um, reliability, um, and just the same with uh, the background investigations that uh, they do on us uh, ongoing. Uh, you just you, you we open our lives to the government. We've opened our lives for 23, 24 years now to the United States government. Um, fully exposed. Jeez, that's really cool. I did I didn't know that that you take uh, lie detector tests like that. That's cool. Oh, I love it. Lie detector tests. More so a sweat detector test. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, it is. Oh my goodness. So you, you get like nervous when it when it Oh yeah. Because I feel like I could pass a lie detector. Can you? Yeah, I, I get nervous Let's do taking it. We can do it right now. quiz to figure out which Harry Potter house I belong to. So <laughs> like, it just doesn't, those are absolutely, but I, I mean, I understand why it's done and um, it does, it, it really is to open up another line of questioning, but um, yes. And, and I think where Andy was going was there's no suspicion whatsoever with the cold ends and, and we just, we do not um, suspect, but we want to make sure that they understand the reasons why we would ask for their um, phone records were to look at other people that might be around that time that might be interested in the case. That Oh, for sure. And, and to um, create a sort of um, basis for a timeline, like phone records are really good to create a, uh, you, you know, you can point out where someone was within a certain range, when they spoke to someone, who they spoke to. So it's really important for a timeline. I certainly would, uh, would never suspect the the Coldens for anything <laughs> nefarious, either. Um, but uh, yeah, interesting. Lie detectors. I no, I feel like I could pass it. I feel like I could convince myself of anything, and I could successfully pass it, unless Vanessa was giving it to me. If she walked in the room, well, that's what I was going to say. Do you want to test it? I really want to. I think we can do it without the equipment. I think we could do it right here. Oh, on hit me, this call. hit me. A couple, couple of yes or no questions. See, I could get you. I could, I could find out if you're lying or not. But uh, unfortunately. Due to COVID restrictions and social distancing, that's not appropriate. <laughs> oh my God! They switched the good cop, bad cop. Role. <laughs> Didn't wow. see that coming. <laughs>